Um, <clears throat> we're going to spend a couple minutes reviewing what we did last time, then we're going to go into uh, new territory. Uh, first of all, um, one thing that we did last time is we gave an overview of client-side scripting versus server-side scripting. And we kind of decided this. Server side scripting was responsible for responding to requests. In other words, the client or whoever is using the website, whether they be on a phone or uh, a laptop or a desktop or a gaming console or whatever. They make requests for web pages that could be by typing in the URL that could be clicking on a link. That gets routed through the Internet to the server and the server responds to it and. The response is usually to send an HTML page. All right, and in many cases, the server has to do some work to assemble the HTML pages. That's why it's a server side script. It may have to access a database or other services and pull information together to create the web page specific for the request. In other words, for the specific user or for the specific geographical area or uh, for the specific time of day or whatever. So the server responds to requests and provides HTML. Probably a more generic way to put that is that servers provide content. Really a buzzword these days when you talk about web stuff as being you know, a content provider and things like that. Well, that content is typically stored on a web server somewhere. And it needs to get to the client and it gets there by the server piecing together that content, whether it be from a database, in many cases, or elsewhere. And piecing it together to create a web page. All right. And when we talk about Ajax, the content will get delivered in a different way, but it's still the web server providing content. We're going to start out talking about client side scripting. And client side scripting provides interactivity. on delivered pages. Now, keep in mind that this is a simplification, all right? Uh, you, know, uh, you know, almost anything you can say in information technology, you can find exceptions for. Um, but I, I think for our purposes, it's uh, to recognize that the client side scripting provides interactivity to delivered pages. And a general meaning of interactivity is something happens and the page responds. Now, something happens is oftentimes a user takes an action. User clicks on something, or the user puts their mouse over something, or presses a key down, or uh, scrolls, or the page finishes loading, or whatever. But typically, it's a user action, and the page responds. Um, it's not always user actions. For example, if you were to look at the code for uh, G a Gmail account, you know, if you're on your Gmail account and you get sent an email, that email appears on the top of your list of uh, 
of received emails. You don't have to do anything for that to happen. Just a certain amount of time elapses and the, the client side is constantly looking for new messages, asking the server if there's a new message. And if there is one, then it pops it up. So in that case, if something happened would simply be probably a small slice of time has occurred. But again, we're gonna focus on user actions. I just wanna emphasize again that this is a simplest, uh, you know, a, 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 a simple overview that's probably good enough for our purposes. And therefore, the recipe for client-side scripting in many of the cases, in many of the cases that we're going to examine, is that the user does something and the page responds. Okay, user does something and the page responds. What do I mean by the user does something? I mean, one of the events on the page occurs. What are events? They're actions that typically a user can take, like putting their mouse on an item, clicking on an item, and so on. If we want to look, we can search for Events. Get a list of these. And here's some of the common ones, but there's there's more. And we'll look at we'll look at the common ones and we'll look at more. On change. In other words, if you've changed something on a form, so if Option A was selected and then you changed uh, to option B to trigger an action. The user clicks on something. The user puts their mouse over something. The user takes their mouse out. The user presses a key or the page finishes loading. These are all common events that you write code for. All of them, but the page finish loading is really a response, you know, a response to some specific action that the user takes. And there's more of these too. That you can do. Blur, when the user leaves a field, you can do something. Dragging and dropping. When a, when a field gets focused, in other words, when the cursor moves into a text box or something, whole bunch of these things. So that's what we mean by the user does something. One of these JavaScript events. All right. And when we say that the page responds, we say that. Couple things come into play. There's the JavaScript language. And we'll slowly uh, learn more and more about the JavaScript language throughout the uh, course. If you've done any other programming before, which I expect you have, you've seen things like if statements and loops and assignment statements and functions and that sort of thing. All those things exist in JavaScript as well. So we just have to learn the syntax for them in JavaScript. Now, the good news is the syntax in JavaScript is very similar to the syntax in C Sharp, which probably many of you have used before. So not identical, 
All right, I'm not saying JavaScript and, and C sharp is ident are identical, but it's similar enough. Now's a good time to make a point that um, is important that JavaScript is not Java. Right? A lot of times I heard people I hear people say about putting Java on their page when they really mean JavaScript. JavaScript is a, is a client side scripting language that allows interactivity on web pages. Java can be used on websites, but typically it's used on the server side. Now it's also possible to use JavaScript on the server side as well, but that's a discussion for another day. Our focus is on client side script. So you have the full force of the JavaScript language, loops, assignment statements, if statements, functions, and so on. The other key component comes into the DOM, the document object model. And that's how you refer to things on the page that you want to do something with, that you're going to get the value of, that you're going to change the color of, that you're going to make visible, that you're going to make on, uh, invisible. Now, what are some things that are commonly done in JavaScript? the drop down menus or the pull down menus where you put your mouse over something and a menu appears. That's classic JavaScript. Uh, another thing that is done is uh, a, fo a photo gallery. Whereas you click through, you see the next picture or you can click a thumbnail and see a picture that typically is done in, in JavaScript. Form validation, whereas if the user enters some data before that data gets sent, sent to the uh, server to be processed, um, it uh, gets validated to make sure that the data uh, looks like it could be correct. All these things are wins if you can do them in a the client side, because then you're not traveling through the internet and taking up more time for the user. And also, you're not burdening the server with stuff that the client can do just as well. It's kind of like in a restaurant where server puts little tray that has ketchup and mustard and salt and pepper and sugar for your coffee and creamer for your coffee on the table so that you can do it yourself. If you want to add salt to your fries, if you want to change that plate that got delivered to you, if you want to add salt to the fries, you can do it yourself. You don't have to flag down a server and ask them to add salt to your fries. Okay, we looked at this example last time, and I think we expanded it a little bit. And this was a mouse over menu. And we have a real simple one, put your menu, uh, put your mouse on it. And if you pull your mouse out, nothing happens. How do you make it so that when you put your mouse out, it disappears? Well, you would put an on mouse out function on it. Again, we change the event. We have to put that also on the submenu. So when the user takes their mouse off of the link and puts it on the submenu, the submenu remains appearing. So save this, refresh, mouse in, mouse out, mouse in. And again, we're getting that little bit of a gap. So we had that same issue last time. And we can change that by saying
everything has a zero margin. So that that div is right up against that link. Uh, link. And it should fix it. Or not. Did I refresh the page? Must have. Well, there we go. Pull it out, it disappears. Okay. That's what we did last time. Now, Let's imagine that we extend this example. We have this JavaScript code. We, we have this HTML and JavaScript code to display uh, a menu and a submenu. Now, what if we were doing like ESPN's page or LC's page for that matter? We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven links that all behave the same. By all behave the same, I mean that when you put your mouse on them, you get a sub, a sub menu to appear underneath them. Now, that would mean if we were gonna do it the slow brute force way, that would mean Let's just do a second one. If we were to do a second one, call this submenu two. We have to copy that code. It's not working exactly the way I wanted it to, but you sort of get the idea. You'd have to copy the code. And if you had seven of these, you'd have to copy the code seven times. Programmer, that should shoot an alarm off in your head. Anytime you're copying sections of code and repeating it more than once, that's an opportunity for you to improve your code. Now, what do I mean when I say improve your code? By and large, better code means one thing. Well, one of the things that better code implies is maintainability. What do I mean by maintainability? I mean ease at which that you can go in and change the code if needed. For example, I copy that code two times. If you can imagine me copying it seven times, if I discovered a bug in that code, I would have to make that change in seven different places, actually 14 different places because I would have the link and I would have the div. That's not very maintainable, right? It's better to have all the code in one place and simply call on it from different places. And in programming terms, the way that you do that is you put your code in a function. A function is where you group commands together Give them a name, and then you can call that function wherever you need to. That's what we're going to do in our next example. Your slogan as a programmer should be DRY, do not repeat yourself. Or at the very least, repeat only small things like calling a function. 
So let's look at our next example, which is sort of uh, an expansion of what we did in CISS 216, if, I, if my memory serves. We have Luke Skywalker's dad is show spoiler, Yoda, hide spoiler. Baby Yoda is Q, hide spoiler. Who shot first, Han, hide spoiler. spoiler. We also have toggle spoiler, which turns it on if it's invisible, makes it visible makes it invisible if it is visible. So it changes it to the opposite of what it is. Let's look at the code that does that because we use a function. So what do I mean by a function? I mean, we put our code in one place and give it a name. And then when we want that function to occur, we call it with the name of the function that we give it. So let's look at the HTML and CSS first to make sure that we understand. I've set the, the style for everything that is a spoiler to be display of none. If we we're gonna do this in the other example would set the style of something called submenu. Better than doing it for a class in each individual item. So I have all my spoilers here. And they all have a class of spoiler, which means that when the page uh, initially loads, the display is set to none. So when I load it, none of these things with the class of spoiler appear. However, when we click those buttons, these functions are called. Let's look at these functions. This function says, show spoiler. The function is named show spoiler. And we give it an argument of ID spoiler. What is an argument? An argument is specific information about what you want to do. In other words, when we click a button, when we click the show button, we want to show the spoiler. Well, which spoiler do we want to show? Do we want to show all of them? Do we want to show half of them? Do we want to show the first, second, or third spoiler? We have to tell it. And so what we're going to do is we're going to give the ID of the thing that we want to show. So I put in ID spoiler as an argument to the function. And that's a placeholder for whatever value we give it when we call the function. So when we click this button, what spoiler do we want to show? We want to show spoiler one. So I pass as an argument to this function the word spoiler one. When I click on the show spoiler button, spoiler two, What, are, what is the argument? It's spoiler two. Why? Because that's the thing that we want to show. Likewise with spoiler three. We could have a hundred spoilers on this page, and each one, when we click it, the ID of the spoiler that we wanted to show. That value, whatever ID we want to show, gets put in this variable. And therefore, when I say document get element ID, which ID? The thing that's in the variable ID spoiler. Or in other words, spoiler one, spoiler two, or spoiler three, whichever one I clicked on. I want to change that thing's style 
And specifically, I want to set the display to block. So I want to make it appear, in other words. And for good measure, I change the color of it to blue. I just did that to demonstrate that um, you can change things other than the, um, other than the, the visibility of something. So we click on this one, we give the function the value of spoiler one. The word spoiler one gets put in this variable. That's the ID that we're going to set the display to block and set the color to blue. Hide works the same way. Except for making it disappear. So not worry about the toggle right now. We'll come back to that one. So if I wanted to add another spoiler, I should brush up on my Star Wars because I can't think of any spoilers. Uh, What is Darth Vader? Well, of course, he is cool. So I'm going to make the ID of this spoiler four. Remember, everything on the page has to have a unique ID for this to work. Elements can share the same class, however, that means they're the same kind of thing. And in this case, we give it a class of spoiler. So when we call the function, we want to, we want to show spoiler four, or we want to hide spoiler four. Now you might say, well, you sort of repeated yourself. And yeah, I guess I did. But repeating one simple line of code that calls a function is much more straightforward than duplicating all the code that you're going to see in here. Remember, we have a relatively simple function here. A function can actually contain any lines of code. There might be other things we do when we show the spoiler. We might change an image on the page, something else. We might make the text bigger. We might do all kinds of things. And therefore, we don't want to duplicate multiple lines of code. Duplicating a single function call, yeah, that's, that's small potatoes. Now, if we could come up with a way where we did have to duplicate this code, that would be really nice. All right. But for now, yeah, we're okay with duplicating this little bit. So let's follow the process through one more time. This button gets clicked on. I call the function and I give it, and close in quotes, the word spoiler one. It's enclosed in quotes because we want that value exactly. At this point, we're not referring to a variable called spoiler one. We are referring to the actual letters, S-P-O-I-L-E-R-1. We want that to be called, uh, we want that to be the argument for this function that we're calling, show spoiler. We call this function, that value, those letters, string, is put in the variable ID spoiler. Now here, ID spoiler is not enclosed in quotes because we're talking about the value of a variable. Not literally. In other words, we're not showing the thing that has an ID of ID spoiler. We're showing the thing that has a value of whatever ID spoiler contains, whatever string that contains. All right. Then we make it visible and make the color blue. Likewise, when we hide it, we set the display to none.
Now, the nice thing is, is we are, we can change how we show a spoiler without changing all of this code. Let's say, for example, we want to display our, our, our uh, spoilers differently. Let's say we want to make the spoilers really small text. And when we click on the spoiler, we want to make it bigger. I don't have to go in and change everything. I just have to change the function. And this should work. All right, see our spoiler is displayed, but it's in very small font. Make it a little bigger so you can see it's there. When we click show spoiler, it becomes bigger. High spoiler, it becomes small at all. All we had to do to get that work is change a little piece in the CSS and a little piece in these two functions. We didn't have to go and change each one of these which we would have had to do if each one of these had all these instructions every time we clicked on it, if we didn't use a function to group those, those statements together. In other words, if we did it the way that we did the earlier example where we said on click equals document set, get element by ID, blah, blah, blah. All right. Toggle spoiler. Let's look at that now. I promised we'd come back to it. Looks like I forgot to do something. I did. And in fact, this is a good little lesson. Because I should have gone and I could go and copy this code in here. You know what? I already have a function that shows a spoiler. I might as well use that. So I'll call show spoiler. And I'll give it the same argument that this gets called. See, I'm not repeating myself by having the same code in to show and hide the spoiler. Because if I change it in one place, I needed to go back and change it in this place too. And we saw that I forgot. We are going to have to change this. Say if. Font size equals 0.05M. Or it gets nothing. Still not working. Show and hide is working, but toggle isn't working. Let's see if we can figure out why. This is a good lesson for you. 
See, as a teacher, you always make it seem like you, you did whatever you did on purpose, right? This is a good lesson for you guys because we're going to debug it. What's the first thing we're going to do to debug? We're going to look at the JavaScript console. And on Chrome, you go to more tools, Oops. developer tools, JavaScript console. Don't have any errors. Well, would we ever get an error? Well, if we messed up the syntax, like if we forgot this. That was a problem. All right, and it'll give you an error message and it says it happens somewhere around line 20. And it's not exactly on line 20, it's the line before it, but at least it puts us in the vicinity of where the problem is, we could figure out. But in this case, we're not getting an error. What am I going to do? I'm gonna to send to the JavaScript console the value of the font size. Because clearly this if statement isn't working. How do I know it's not working? I'll bet you that it never calls show spoiler. How can I verify that? I'm going to put in here console.log in show spoiler function. But I might as well log to see if it's in high, if it ever gets to the hide spoiler function. Refresh this. I click show spoiler. It doesn't get to either, it doesn't show either function. Click, oh. I'm sorry, the wrong one. I was spoiler. I was. Toggle spoiler, untaught reference error, DD document is not defined. Ah. I didn't look at the console long enough. I have actually DD instead of document. Now let's save it. Now toggle spoiler works. And notice that my console message is showing that it is in the show spoiler function when it's supposed to be and the hide spoiler function when it's supposed to be. Console log allows you to see values of certain things. Let's say I messed up and made this four. All right. We're going to pretend that I don't realize I made it four. Because I mistakenly thought that's the size that we make it when we show it. Okay, show spoiler worked. Let's pull up our council. Yep, we're in the show spoiler function. Now let's click hide spoiler. The hide spoiler function. Now it's not working. And you notice that little counter indicates it's getting put in the hide spoiler function over and over again instead of alternating. So remember, I know the answer. The answer is that that variable is set wrong. So what can I do? I can put that variable to the log because if this if statement isn't working, it means that this variable isn't the value that I think it is. So I can put this to the console. And 
and I want the actual value of the variable, not those letters. So I can put this in here with no quotes. Pull up the council. Quick show spoiler. Works. The kind spoiler. It works. Zero point oh five EM. 0.05 EM. Well, that's supposed to be in the show uh, method if it's 0 0.5 EM. Oh, my if statement's checking for 0 0.4 EM. Now, it's a good idea if you put council logs in your code to either remove them or comment them once you get it working. But using the council log is an important way of systematically debugging your, your code. I, a lot of people, when they get errors, they stare at the code and thinking by staring at it as hard as they can, the error will jump out of the screen into their brain and they will understand exactly what's wrong and exactly what to change. It doesn't work that way. All right. By logging certain things, like which part of the if statement you're going in, what's the value of certain variables, and so on, you can more systematically debug this. So if you come to me with a JavaScript problem, I'm going to ask you, what are you seeing in the council? And if you tell me nothing, I'm going to say, have you logged anything? All right. I'm not doing that to be mean. I'm doing that to emphasize taking a systematic approach to debugging your code. A preview of what we're going to look at next week. We have a couple minutes to spare here. It's an interesting. This page gets errors. This will be made available pretty soon. It's always good to review the materials before you come to class. One thing that we can do is we can change the background of the paragraph to whatever color we type in. We can keep a history of what we've changed it to. Or we can clear the history and start fresh. Some of this we've seen before, some of this we haven't. We've seen how to change the color of something because we changed the color of the spoiler text. 
we're just going to have to look at a way to change the color or the foreground color. One thing about this page is totally different is we're not using any events. At least not defining events in the HTML. And that is probably confusing for you if you were to look at this code. But take a look at it anyhow and try to see if you understand what's going on. What we're actually doing is in this example is we're making a very clean separation between the HTML, the JavaScript, and the CSS so that everything is in its right place. There's only HTML in the HTML part of the document. There's only CSS in the CSS part of the document. And there's only JavaScript in the JavaScript of the department uh, uh, part of the uh, page. The more that you can separate stuff like that, the easier it will be to maintain and therefore is better code. I mentioned easy maintainability for code is, is being a, uh, a key factor in what code is better than others. Other factors include, include how it handles error processing um, and things such as that. How robust it is, how easy it is to make a change without blowing up the whole application and so on. So does it work across platforms, I guess, is another criteria. And finally, you know, how does it handle when there is some kind of error situation? So we'll take a look at this, which is another step further down the line of making our code better by, rely, by allowing us to completely separate the HTML from, and from the CSS and JavaScript. All right, do we have any questions out there? If not, that's all I had for this week. Um, I will be in uh, BU210, uh, and uh, you can virtually join me in the WebEx room. So we will see you next week if I don't see you in lab.